Welcome back to the Quarantine Kitchen. It's the Quarantine Kitchen. It's the Quarantine Kitchen. It's the Quarantine Kitchen. Welcome to the kitchen where nothing else is really going on. So we're just gonna be cooking some stuff in the kitchen. It's the Quarantine Kitchen. Once again, I'm really sorry about that theme song. I'm not really sure what was going through my mind, but I do know that I'm not gonna re-record it. So as long as I'm stuck in here, uh, you're stuck with that. Anyway, today, um, I'm guessing many of you, probably at this point in time, you've drunk through your entire 24 box of Corona that you ironically bought before the lockdown happened, and you're wanting to, you know, maybe get your kick somewhere else. So we're going to look at making alcoholic ginger beer from home. Now just remember, if prisoners can make prison hooch in a cistern or the toilet in their cell, um, you can make some pretty good beer at home, even though you might not have all of the equipment. So what we're going to do with this video is we're going to break it up into several stages. The first one is going to be talking about the equipment and the ingredients so that if we get to the end of that segment and you don't think you can get any of that stuff, then you can pretty much stop watching at that point until you're ready to come back. Maybe say, you'll watch later list, come back and watch it when you've got everything. So as far as equipment goes, you'll notice I have a very big pot behind me and then I've got a giant drum there, a 30 litre beer barrel. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a beer barrel that size. You can use a bucket. I've done it in a bucket before. I've done it in, uh, if you went out and bought one of those big water cooler things that you use for storing water that you only bought when you were panic buying at the beginning of the lockdown announcement. And uh, now you've got a big empty one of those because they won't take anything other than glass away in the recycling. You can even use that as well. But what you will need is um, to make things a little bit easier is you, you'll want to make an airlock or get an airlock if you don't have one. If you can buy one, these are really cheap. If not, you can make one. Um, and I'll show you how with the magic of a forced perspective. So to make an airlock at home, effectively all you need is four things. Uh, you'll want some sort of canister or container, not like this one with a screw lid will be better. Um, and you'll want some straws or some tubing and a hot glue gun is essential as well and effectively all you're doing is you're putting one of these straws up through here until it comes above the water line not with the water in there you can add that later glue it in there and then you have another one that goes in down here into the water and what happens is it'll act as an airlock the gas will come up into here it will fill this chamber until it pushes <laughs> some water and air up out of there so you will get a bit of drippage just an editor's note here, I didn't realise until I was editing this that I'd improvised a slightly better airlock like this. It was basically a tube coming out of the container, uh, going into and underneath some water inside a jar. Um, the, the hose going into the jar lid was completely sealed, but there were some holes, some little nail holes in the jar lid so that the gas could come out. So effectively a bubble was coming out here and then escaping through those holes. This one was much more effective and didn't have any of that drippage that I just spoke about. Trying to avoid droplets here, people. Come on, it's an epidemic. This brew is going to take about five days, so you probably want an airlock to stop any bugs or bad stuff getting into the brew. You're also going to want something to get the alcohol or the liquid out of your bucket once you're done. Um, if you're using a bucket with no tap, this one has a tap at the bottom. If you don't have that, you'll want some sort of siphon or, or hose so that you can get everything out without having to tip. Because once you tip it, all of the stuff that floats in there at the bottom, that'll end up in your in your bottles and that's not really what you want. And then as far as tools go, you want some essential cooking utensils and stuff like that. You want knives. I have a thermometer there. It's not really necessary, but it just makes the whole process a bit easier. And then you'll want some stuff for bottling it as well. So don't start with this if you don't have enough bottles to put it into. I'm going to be using glass bottles. I have a bottler. I have enough caps. I've checked that all out. Uh, if not, you can use plastic bottles, which is probably recommended in the method I'm using because it, it goes for less explosions and less glass flying everywhere, which uh, just, you know, that just sounds a lot safer now that I'm saying it out loud. Um, but we'll talk about all that as we go through. So that's the equipment portion covered off. The next thing we're going to talk about is ingredients. Some of these are essential to make it, and then some of them are just for my own preference and my own taste. And as I go through the ingredients, I'll talk about what they are and uh, if you need them or not. So the first thing I've gone and grabbed is I've got a whole bunch of ginger. So this is going to be about 25, around 20 to 25 liters of beer. And um, this time around, I've got 1.2 kgs of ginger. So the ginger is essential because we're making ginger beer and this is what helps give it its flavor. The next thing you're going to need is sugar. Uh, now the basic math for this, I'll refer to my handwritten ingredients, my big book of ideas. 
So apparently every every five liters of beer, you wanna have about 25 grams of sugar and the sugar will get turned into alcohol. So that way you get about a 5% brew, if, if my memory serves me right, because I got that on a forum a couple of weeks ago. I can't really find that forum anymore, but this is the, the basic formula. So for a 25 liter brew, you'd want about a kg of sugar. I'm doing 1.5 kgs of sugar, going slightly over to make a slightly more powerful brew, around 7%. I'm also adding 500 grams of blackstrap molasses just for color and flavor. Uh, and then I also have there's a fly in here. I think it's gone. And then also uh, as part of the sugar, I have some raw agave nectar, some dark raw agave nectar, and that plays three roles in this agave. Ah. I look like an idiot in front of my friends. Raw organic agave nectar, and that's gonna play three roles in this. So uh, you'll hear that sound every time I'm talking about a role that it plays in here. So those are the essential parts of this to, to give it alcohol content. Um, everything else that I'm talking about in here is my preference for flavor. I recommend if you're gonna try this out, at least give some of these a go. Um, so the first one is limes. I've got a couple of limes there, some organic limes, three organic limes, and then a couple of regular limes. I'm going to use five limes for juice and then I'm going to use three of them. I'm going to just peel the peel off and put that in there as well in the brew uh, just to give it some zest and some extra flavor. The main reason that I like to use molasses and I like to use lime is because these two flavors, they remind me of rum and, and lime that you have in like a dark and stormy, which is my favorite type of cocktail, which uses ginger beer. So I figure the closer I can make my alcoholic ginger beer to that cocktail, the more I'll enjoy it. You know, I, I really do like rum. Where's, where's the rum picture gone? No, our rum lady. Yeah, um, is she over there? Yeah, ah, oh, she's over there. Old Rita, getting away from us. I do enjoy rum. I've got some cinnamon, so I'm gonna put one cinnamon stick in and brew that with everything. Uh, I've also got some cloves, so I'm gonna use a whole tablespoon of those cloves and put that in there. I really like my ginger beer with a bit of spice, so this time around I'm gonna put three chilies in. <laughs> To the mix as well just to add to the flavor and, and add to the spiciness and then on top of that i've got a few additives uh, i've got horopito which is a new zealand herb if you saw my last video of quarantine kitchen with the kids who were making some sausage rolls and i put horopito in there that's otherwise known as new zealand pepper leaf um, and that again adds a little bit of pepper to the mix so it's very unlikely you'll have horopito available to you um, i'm only going to use six teaspoons of horopito anyway so uh, in the grand scheme of things that's not really going to leave that much of a it's only going to be a hint of flavor it's not going to change the mix very much what i am going to add which uh, you guys won't be able to most likely won't be able to do is some kawa kawa now last time i used this in the last video as well and it's a very finely grated up herb um, I don't really want to use that because what you normally do at the end of the brewing process is there's a process called fining which is where you add an additive to the brew. It traps all of the dead yeast and all of the floaty bits and it puts them on the bottom of the bucket and then you can't really suck those up into the bottles when you're doing the bottling part. This, because it's so light and floaty, it would end up in all of the bottles and I don't want that to happen. So what I've done earlier is I jumped out into the bush and I harvested some wild cow cow, which I'll show you now. Bingo. This is a very young plant. It's not really exactly ideal to take leaves from when it's a so I'm only going to take one from this one and then we're going to look for another one. And what you want to do as well, for medicinal purposes, is you want to take ones that have as many holes in them as possible. This one has one hole. <laughs> Um, there's a certain kind of caterpillar that loves to eat these, get out of here supplejack, uh, loves to eat these leaves and what happens when he eats them is there, there's an enzymic reaction in the, uh, the leftover leaf flesh and that's where all the medicinal properties come into play. So I'm only going to grab one from this one, we'll head on up through the supplejack and see if we can find any more. Ideally we want about 12, uh, maybe, maybe Ten at least. I think I've run my luck out of here. Uh, I don't think there are any more kawakawa bushes up this way. Whoop! It's very slippery and very steep. We head back down through the galley and uh, try the other side of the property. Here's another one right here. 
just growing out of the riverbank. You can tell it's little heart-shaped leaves. It looks like something's had a nibble on this. Could have been a deer or a stag, potentially. Oh, that one's got a couple of bites. I'm going to take this little one. Oop. Oh, what do you know? There's another one. <laughs> this one's growing out of the same system here, and it's got a nice big broad leaf there. I'll leave that one alone. Little, little baby leaf there, still growing. And then this one that's been totally munched on, that one definitely would have been a deer. So I took a bite out of that. Uh, so <laughs> I'll pluck it, I'll give it a good wash. Ah. I think I hit the jackpot on this side of the bank because just over here, past this rotten log I'm standing on, there is a huge bush. Look at it. Ah, brilliant. There's another one that's had a big bite taken out of it. I'm going to take a big broadleaf this time. Oop. There we go, another big broadleaf there. So these things like to grow... Well, I don't know how they like to grow, because we've got one growing up um, on the edge of the bank over there, way away from any water source, and it's doing really well. And then we've got this one here growing right next to a creek, and it's going really well as well, so I don't really know what it wants. What have we got flying around up there? Can't quite see it, but there's some, we've got some company up there flying around, making sure we don't take too much from the forest. There he is, it's a tui. Look at that. Should be bird of the year. Should have been bird of the year. Don't be fooled by this one. I always used to think this was kawakawa when I saw it growing, even though it's, when it's, when it's a baby, the leaves are kind of similar, I guess. It's really little. Uh, but this stuff isn't kawakawa. I don't remember what it's called, but apparently it's got like a silver backside to it. Makes good toilet paper. So if we ever run out, we got loads here, which is good for the quarantine. Not so much quarantine kitchen business, but I mean, it all leads to that, doesn't it? Meanwhile, back in the kitchen. You'll notice that one of the ingredients that I'm missing here that seems essential for this is yeast. Um, now, if you have the capacity or, or if it's available to you to go out and buy like champagne yeast or beer maker's yeast, brewer's yeast, go ahead and do that. It'll make the whole process a lot easier and a lot faster. Um, I can't do that because we've had all of those stores closed and there's actually no yeast in the country really. Um, I do have yeast for making bread and pizza dough and that sort of thing, but it doesn't really work with beer. So what I've done is I've made a ginger bug, um, which is just agave, 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 it's just agave nectar, crushed ginger and water that I've added into this container. Um, I started this about six days ago. There's no reason why you'd need it to go for six days. Five should be fine. Once you notice it bubbling like this, it's ready to go. Um, it's just that's how long ago I realized that I wouldn't be able to get yeast and then that's how long it's taken me to get everything else together. I realized during editing this video that I made a very bad job of explaining what a ginger bug is. So to break it down, uh, what you're looking at here is a cup of clean water that I put a teaspoon of crushed ginger and a teaspoon of sugar into. The sugar I chose was agave nectar. You don't need to do that. You could choose to put in just regular white sugar or brown sugar or whatever you have it on hand. Uh, what a ginger bug is, is it's a repository for catching wild yeast. That sugar and that ginger helps feed the yeast, which gets captured in the water. And, and you'll notice that it's alive when it starts bubbling, which is what I referred to earlier. Every day you just need to feed it with another teaspoon of sugar and another teaspoon of crushed ginger. Most people grate the ginger up, but I've chosen not to just because I don't want little floaty bits again. I want something that's easy to trap and uh, won't go through the tap on my giant bucket. And that is what a ginger bug is. Back to the show. So you need that or you need maybe two sachets of champagne yeast or beer yeast or whatever if you can get your hands on that. So we'll come back to that when we get to that point in the brew. Uh, but now we're up to, we've done the ingredients, we've done the equipment. We're up to step two of the process, which is the method behind making all of this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab all of this ginger that I have here and I'm going to slice it quite roughly up, crush it with the blunt part of the blade of the knife and I'm going to chuck it into my big gigantic pot. I'm going to add a water to that. I've got a, three liters of water that's going in there and I'm going to just start heating that and basically making a tea. So I'm going to be making a tea with the ginger. I'll slice up my uh, my chilies and I'll chuck them in there and then I'll add my kawakawa, my cinnamon and my cloves. And I'm going to let all of those just steep for quite a while. I'll bring it up to the boil, let it steep and let it leach out all of that flavor so it's, you know, 
a pretty strong ginger tea. Um, I'll add the horopito at that point as well. Just add those teaspoons in there and let that steep along with everything else. And then I'm going to melt in and dissolve my sugar and my molasses. And I'm going to bring the total thing up. I think that's a 10 litre pot. You want a, a, a sizable pot so all of your ingredients can fit in there. I'm going to bring it right up to the top. Um, make it nice and warm. Add some more water. Make sure everything's all dissolved. And let it come up to the boil one more time. After that, I'll turn off the heat. I'll add it to my giant bucket and I'll pour in some water to bring it up to the top and that will help bring the temperature down because you want the temperature to be below 30 degrees, ideally around 25 degrees before you add your yeast into it. This yeast has been living in my hot water cupboard for the last couple of days so it's used to a pretty stable temperature of around 25 degrees, any higher than that and I could risk killing it and ruining the whole brew. And I won't know that it's ruined until the next day and by then it's too late to try and save it because I can't add any more yeast to it. It's, I've got none in the house. Once it's cooled down before I add the yeast, I'm actually going to add my lime juice. I add it when it's quite cool so the lime juice doesn't really get cooked. And then my lime peel as well. And then right before I add the yeast, I also add about a cup, 250 mils of agave nectar. Um, even though we've got enough sugar there to keep everything going, I'm adding it right at the end so it doesn't boil out all the flavour and it's just to add some sweetener to uh, to the drink as well because it, the way it is with all the sugar going in now, it's going to be quite dry. So I'm going to save that agave for, for that last bit. Um, before I do any of this, I've given the pot a good sterilisation. I boiled some water, flushed it through there. I've scrubbed all of my ginger, I've cleaned all of the poo and all of the dirt off the kawa kawa from the bush. I'm going to clean the limes, the organic ones, because I'm using their peels. And I'm going to wash the chilies as well before I add them all in. So just a little bit of safety. You, don't, you want to try and avoid any bad bugs getting in there. Um, so that the yeast and all the good bugs can do their work and eat up all the sugar and fart out a bunch of alcohol. So that's the end of stage two of putting everything together. Obviously I haven't done it yet because you, I've, I've narrated what I'm about to do. Um, but at this stage what we do is we leave it in the bucket, leave it in a nice warm temperate spot. So I'm going to leave it in the kitchen because it stays quite the same temperature throughout the day. And tomorrow it should be bubbling away with the yeast reacting to all of the sugar that's gone in there. And that's a really good sign. You want to wait about five days for that bubbling to slow down. At the end of the five days you'll, you'll notice that the bubbling tends to stop a little bit. If it's not bubbling as much you can always poke a spoon in there and stir it around or give it a little bit of a shake and that'll help get the yeast active again and start some more activity and, and then it'll keep doing its thing. Uh, generally in the mornings when it's a, a cold point you know it's not as active so that's where you want to give it a little bit of a kickstart and, and do that again. Normally when I make beer I, I use a, a store-bought yeast and that takes about four or five days to go through the fermentation process and at the end of that another day to do the fining where we add something to just trap all of the dead yeast and everything at the bottom of the bucket. And this one's been in here at a pretty constant temperature for seven days now and it's still very active. So I'm just going to let it run its course once this stops bubbling as much and these water levels balance a little bit more uh, then I will bottle it or rack it, I think they call it, and uh, put it into storage for two weeks and come back and do a taste test. So that's, I'm not too worried that it's still fizzing. If I open it up, you can still see it fizzing away. And this is the, the yeast of my worries at the moment. Did you hear that joke? Yeah. I said the yeast of my worries. All up, this brew actually fermentated for a full 14 days before it was sort of quiet enough for me to bottle it. And even then it was still a little bit active. I just felt uncomfortable leaving it out for more than two weeks because that's kind of the time frame that all of the blogs I could find suggested that you should let it ferment for, for a full period. I can't see why I shouldn't have let it go longer, but just erring on the safety, I didn't want to waste a full 25 litres of beers. At the end of five days, you'll notice it's pretty much slowed right down. So what you can do at that point is if you have a way of finding it, uh, and that is like what I spoke about before, putting an additive in there to trap all of the sediment at the bottom. A good way of doing it is gelatin. Uh, I'm not going to do that though because it's not vegan. So I'm going to stay away from that and I can't get my hands on the vegan equivalent of that. So that's off the table. This is going to be a very cloudy beer. For me but if you like a nice clear one which i can show you an example of 
um, that's what you need to do to make it look like that. Once you get to that point, 24 hours after finding it, or once the yeast is completely stopped and, and stopped being active, uh, you get ready for bottling and you want to sterilize all of your bottles, get them all ready so that you've got enough to capture all of the liquid. Put some towels, <laughs> just put some towels down on the floor because you will make a mess. Um, even if you're using a system like this with a proper tap and you know, one of these long straws and and one of these stoppers, I, I find that even though I'm going to be chopping the ingredients quite thickly so that it doesn't end up coming through the straw, um, you still get little bits stuck in there and, and you have to take it apart and you do spill. So put towels down and then you need to prime the bottles. So I'm going to use the agave nectar and the last part it plays in this is in the, the bottle priming. Per sort of 300 milligrams I'll add a teaspoon of agave nectar. So for my little bottles it's one, for my 500 ml bottles because I have a, an assortment it'll be two and for the 750 ml bottles it's three. So there's a little bit of inaccuracy there and you just need to be careful when popping some of them that they don't fizz up. It's a slow, a slow release. And then at that point, once they're all bottled up, it's putting them in the cellar for two weeks and hoping like hell that it all worked out. Uh, don't get tempted to open them too early and try and keep them somewhere nice and cool because ideally when you, especially if you're using a live bug like this one, you are meant to be able to burp them. Now we've given it a nice five days to kind of get all of the activity done and dusted. Um, so adding that little bit of agave nectar might start adding more carbon dioxide and it might get a bit volatile. Uh, so you don't want it to be anywhere warm, you don't want to pick it up and shake it, you just want to leave it to do its thing, put it somewhere where if it does explode it's not going to hurt you or your family and uh, in two weeks time, you know, fingers crossed, you can come back to it and taste it and see what it's like. So hopefully that's given you some good advice about what to do. Hopefully you, you can give it a go yourself because I'd love to hear about how it goes. Uh, two weeks time from this video posting, I'm going to post the taste testing of this one uh, and any any anecdotes of uh, explosions and that sort of thing. So if you want to play it safe, you can hang out, come back and, and watch that in two weeks. Uh, otherwise, stay safe, have a happy quarantine and stay healthy. And uh, I'll see you guys all in the next video. I wanna taste your content, hold your breath and feel the tension. Devils hide behind redemption. Honesty is a one-way gate down.